The word innovation is on everyone's lips, but innovation has a thousand faces. Blockchain, renewable energy, artificial intelligence, digital transformation, virtual reality, entrepreneurship, diversity, space. Innovation means new technologies, new behaviours, new mindsets. So how can we make sense of it all? How do we clarify these new dynamics to better navigate today and tomorrow's disruptions? Let's dig deeper. Let's dive into the wide world of innovation with the experts. Welcome to the AXA Live Innovation Talks. Welcome to the AXA Live Innovation Talks where we explore how we can spur innovation in health, sustainability, climate, and many other topics. We regroup experts, practitioners, entrepreneurs to discuss how we can go further. You can follow us and have more on our social media, uh, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. Today is uh, the opening of season two of the AXA Live Innovation Talks. And today we will be exploring how can we innovate skills to improve sustainability. And for this, I am really uh, happy to welcome three distinguished guests who will help us explore further and get, share with us insights on how we can develop those skills. With us uh, today is uh, Tyra Malzi, Tyra, you are the EMEA Director of Talent and Global Head of Wellbeing and Engagement at JLL. Amongst your mission, you lead um, learning and upskilling of uh, talents and projects, and you work at building a culture of diversity, inclusion, belonging, and well-being at JLL. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Georges. Aurélien, Aurélien Aquier, you are the Associate Dean for sustainability at the ESCP Business School and the uh, co-chair co of the, um, the ESCP Chair in Circular Economy. Your research focuses on uh, the integration of sustainability, social responsibility uh, issues in complex organizations. So again, thank you to share this time with us. Thank you, Georges. And uh, Antoine Poincaré, you are the Vice President uh, for the AXA Climate School. The AXA Climate School is an online learning experience that encompasses over 250 micro-learning chapters to engage and upskill employees and help organizations in their transition. And uh, I wanted to add that uh, it is not just uh, for the AXA group, but actually being uh, leveraged by many other organizations uh, in the world. So thank you, Aurélien and Antoine and uh, Tyra to share this time with us. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into the topic. So the first question, I think, or the first uh, point is, what's going on right now? What's up? And uh, sustainability, um, you know, has a wide range of issues uh, from climate change to health to inclusion. And today we want to focus uh, primarily on the climate aspects. And uh, as an introduction, you know, a few days ago, um, AXA has uh, released its annual edition of the uh, Future Risk Report. Uh, this global report um, encompasses the views from uh, multiple experts as well as public opinion on uh, what are their perception of the major risks that we are facing uh, in the world. And this year, what was uh, really revealing is that um, climate change uh, risk is back at the top of the list. For, uh, in the global ranking, although there are some differences by regions. Uh, it's top of the list in Europe and uh, United States, uh, but it's uh, uh, only fourth in Africa where I think the health and pandemics is still uh, quite prevalent. So maybe if you can uh, first start with, uh, you know, what do you think, what do you make of these results? And I'll maybe start with you, Tyra. Yeah, well, thank you, George, and congratulations on uh, such an excellent piece of work. It actually echoes what we're seeing, the sentiments of, amongst our clients. So JLL, we're a global real estate leader, and our clients in our survey that we did this year are telling us that at the C level, their top priority is sustainability. 
Um, so we're pretty pleased about this result because um, real estate has a huge impact on sustainability, both on the social side as well as on the environmental side. And if we zoom in on that environmental impact, the built environment accounts for 40% of carbon emissions. So this is both a huge challenge, but also a real opportunity to act. And from the standpoint of you know, looking at the trends, what's happening, what we're seeing is we're still building, right? So you know, month after month, we're building basically the size of New York City around the world. And we still have the stock of existing buildings. So we have to find solutions, both as we build new and what we're doing with old to make this work. Um, so for us at JLL, we're doing two things really. One thing is, this is a mindset shift. So how we're doing and how people are doing their jobs today has to change. And this is across everything that we're doing. And the second thing that we're waking up to is the fact that we're not gonna get there alone. And it's all about partnerships. So how we work across the industry with, with, with uh, our clients, but also with competitors is really you know, how we're thinking about this. Thank you, Dara. Aurélien, what's your take on uh, the uh, topic of risks and climate risks? I think it's really interesting to see uh, these uh, transformations over time. And um, actually, my first reaction would be it's a good sign that we are finally taking these uh, issues seriously and at the right level and at the collectively as well. I would be very, very curious, actually, to know about the differences uh, about this perception. It's very good news that people are uh, caring about this globally. But I've been always uh, puzzled by the, also the heterogeneity of people when it comes to taking into account sustainability. It's true that in some sectors, uh, people are really aware of that. But what I see from my perspective of a professor in a business school is that there, is, uh, there are very important differences according to who you're talking with. Uh, young students are super aware of the issue, the risks, and what is at stake here. And they are not hesitant to challenge, actually, business as usual, classic corporations, and they really are aware about the necessity for radical change. And what's super interesting is that when you go to companies, you see, and when you go to people that are already managers that have been in their managerial career for years, you see a lot more heterogeneity. Some people are very aware and others are not that much aware. And I think that's a key challenge here is how do we align the planets? And uh, part of what we do is trying to align the planet so that everyone is uh, on the same tune on this uh, central story and that you don't have too much misalignment between people that are really aware and people that are sometimes higher in the hierarchy and not that much aware. Yeah. Tyra, for you it's critical and it's all about doing it together and taking actions. You, it's trying to convince and aligning the different population. Aurélien, what's your experience with the climate school? I'd say a bit like Aurélien, what, what's striking is the differences in the heterogeneity, but at a geographical level. So in the risk report, you have this map in which you see that in Europe, climate change is number one, in Africa, it's number four. I think in the US, it's two or three. Um, we need to keep in mind that it's a global problem. We're going to need to fix it all together. Of course, it's converging, but we need to, uh, when you work in sustainability, you tend to have students that are interested in sustainability. You tend to uh, talk to clients and prospects that, that are interested in sustainability. And guess what? Your friends, they are like-minded. So you tend to think that this is the only topic. Mm -hmm. We need to keep in mind that globally, people are worried about health, but guess what? Climate change has an impact on health. Uh, at a global level, people are worried about social inequalities, about migration, and all this, we need to take that into account. We cannot just be uh, sustainability first and, and, and like uh, working in silo. We need to think about it at a global level on global subject of awareness. Excellent. Um, I have to say, just to reassure a bit, uh, that I, what I was uh, uh, really struck with in the last uh, uh, few weeks is that um, um, many of the conversation I have with uh, leaders of uh, global companies, uh, they come and the first thing, one of the first things they talk about is uh, natural catastrophe and how is that uh, uh, affecting their business and would we insure them, mm -hmm. of course. But, but it's actually interesting that would not have happened a year or a year and a half yeah. ago. And therefore, I think that's a good, that's a good sign that it's, it's starting to really resonate uh, with leadership. But if I may, it's really uh, fascinating to see how fast the catch-up is mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was always struck over the previous year 
to see that uh, globally over the world, uh, CO didn't take the uh, climate and environmental risk that seriously. I think it's not the case for insurers like AXA, of course, who were really early to understand the issue. But actually, you have a global survey that is done every year by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. And actually, what they do is that they survey CO from all over the world on their perception of risk. And guess what? Over the last four years, uh, climate change and environmental degradation, biodiversity loss were nowhere in the top risks, in the top 10 risks. And they come back today. But still, last year, it was in the ninth position in the hierarchy of 10. So it's coming back. And I think what we see right now is a great uptake and great catch up about the risk. But we start from somewhere where these risks were not perceived as a strategic, I and think. And discrepancy between yeah. CEO and general population. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we have rising awareness, which is good news. Uh, now, what can we do concretely? And what, what, what are you uh, in your organization doing? And maybe we'll start uh, with you, Antoine. Um, what, uh, what concretely yeah. uh, can we do, can you do, can you uh, uh, provide? So my organization is a team of four, uh, so we try to do stuff, but uh, what we tend to look at is our clients. Uh, we did a survey last year uh, showing with Kite Insight, showing that in France and the UK, 76% of employees, they want to act on climate change. Uh, so that's a great number. Let's keep that in mind, 76%. At the same time, when you look at surveys in France, 5% of people that did a CSR training they see how to apply it in their own jobs. That's a massive failure. I mean, we have a discrepancy between those two numbers in which people, they get told to replace uh, plastic glasses with carton glasses, and that's about it. They don't see how it's, it's having an impact on their job. Uh, that's why we build the climate school. The climate school is here to tell people, as an HR people, as a people that work in IT, uh, as a purchasing guy, as a lawyer within your company, here's how sustainability is impacting your job, Here's what your job is going to look like in 2030 and how you need to adapt. And I think to do it properly, we need to get at job level and sector level. You work in the, in the automotive industry, it's not the same as working in a bank. And as long as we don't get to that level and that granularity of details, we won't uh, make people act and, and evolve in the way they practice that job. So, so, so make it relevant make at, it the, at the level of uh, individual, what they do every day, yeah, exactly. what can they to do themselves. Right? Make it super relevant. For 20 years, we've been telling there was a problem and nobody did nothing. Maybe there is a problem with the message uh, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Tara, what's your experience at JLL? Well, that's a really interesting that you shared those stats about how people can understand the issue but don't know how to act because we're seeing it in the same thing at the corporate level. So in our clients, our top 50 clients, 96% say, yes, we've got a target, but only less than 20% know what that plan is to get there. So part of what we're doing at JLL is figuring out, okay, across that real estate value chain, how can we impact? So starting with you know, the strategy, do, do companies know what the impact of their real estate footprint is? Do they even know how to measure that? So getting that strategy in place, looking then what happens at that asset level. Can we design sustainably? How can we put in whatever it might be, lighting systems, waste management, water management, so that you're reducing your impact? And then when you get to um, you know, the operations, it could be, it could be eliminating single-use plastics. The number of companies that still have that is amazing. Or it could be, you know, when you're doing a refurbishing, do you have to throw away all that carpet and that concrete? Can we recycle it somehow? So thinking about circularity and, and, and upcycling, recycling. And then the final thing is, can we help companies and uh, source renewable energy? So actually, we're doing this right now. We've done a really big project um, in Washington, working with the Metro Line, helping them use underutilized assets, um, their rooftops and parking garages to, in, to insta in, install solar panels. And actually the, the feedback of this is incredible because it's a revenue generator for the Metro Line. And they're now sourcing sustainable um, and renewable energy for about 1,500 houses in, in the, um, around the area. You know, it sounds yeah. so simple when it you think about simple. all these rooftops, and, uh, <laughs> but it, it, takes, uh, it takes many people actually to, yeah. to make it happen, And these right? partnerships, right? Yeah. So it's fantastic. And uh, in, in um, ESCP, you, you, you meet with many people, you influence many people with, with your education. So what, what, what do you do concretely? What, how, how, what tools do you bring to people? What skills? Um, how do you make, um, a, help people make a difference? Yeah. So it's true that for uh, business school, we have a massive impact, of course, first through our educational activities. Uh, 
uh, of course, also with the research activities, but let's focus more on the educational programs that we, we have. Actually, what we, I'm not going to um, explain you all that we do, but first I would say that we have to be aware that um, it's a very significant change in terms of competencies, of knowledge, etc. Because when you look at it from an historical point of view, uh, business schools were not built with a strong environmental focus. So it's kind of a new discipline for us. And it raises fundamental question on who do we partner with? You know, how do we partner with experts that will bring the uh, ecological competencies that we need? And how do we merge that with uh, business competencies? And actually the way we do it is that um, uh, first, we have a clear target of saying we need to have 100% of students trained on the topic it's our responsibility as a business school. We cannot let people go outside of uh, ESCP if they are not properly trained on this topic. Now, what does it mean? Uh, actually, it means two things. The first thing that we absolutely want to do is to provide our students, be it students in the bachelor program or the executive MBA program or the Grande Ecole, they need to have basic uh, ecological training and um, a proficiency on, on this topic, you know? So we call that ecological literacy mm -hmm. or climate literacy. And so we do that through fundamental courses, compulsory courses or through seminars where we bring them the, uh, an, an understanding of what's at stake, what's the challenge, uh, what are the big issues in terms of climate, biodiversity, and how do they represent a risk on our society on our business and so the game is always to have a part where we go outside of business first to provide them with understanding of what's the science behind that and then connect it with business activities to understand how will this impact the company in 20 30 years time or tomorrow actually and how can you rebuild companies according to this challenge so that's the first level of providing ecological literacy and linking it with business and then what we really try to do is to build competencies for both mitigation and adaptation. We know today that it's really important to reduce. So how do we do that at a social and corporate level? But also we need to adapt. And I mean, you're not discovering anything as an insurer, but adaptation to climate change, to biodiversity loss is going to be the next big challenge, I think. And so we have to do that. And how do we do that? By uh, developing more specialized modules, more um, um, uh, options um, where we connect s finance, marketing, etc., with climate, biodiversity topics, and we are many, many ongoing developments which are maybe we'll talk later. That's mm. really interesting because when I we weave the three uh, of mm. you, you know, it's uh, all about making it relevant at a personal level in their context. It's all about finding the right place in the value chain where you can make a difference. And it's really sort of bringing it inside, I would say, of every individual, but also and in giving them the tools for both mitigation and, and, and transition. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. And that leads me a little bit about, you know, our next chapter of our discussion, which is, uh, so how do we, how, what's next? How do we make things happen at a bigger scale? <laughs> And um, uh, maybe I'll start with um, asking um, uh, Aurelien uh, to continue in that dis discussion and say, how do we make those transformations happen mm -hmm. at the society level or at the complex organization, which is part of your research? How do, you, how do we think about it? Um, actually, at the social level, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a huge challenge, but it's very complex also for us to, what we first try to do is to say, okay, we train managers, but we train also citizens. And so every time we train someone, it's both a social impact and a business impact, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what's the next big challenge, I think, for us is to really deeply reflect on um, how do we transform the competencies of the students that will be uh, graduated from our institutions in a few years. And actually, I think we have, we are in front of a very deep redefinition of the skills that we need to think about. And it's a mix, I think, about both uh, hard skills and soft skills. Mm -hmm. Hard skills, you, you mentioned that, Tyra. I think it's super important today to go much further on uh, rethinking the tools for evaluation, for example. Mm -hmm. How can we teach uh, 
um, reporting, how can we teach finance without integrating questions related to the environmental impact. So here, the big challenge in terms of uh, hard skills is, for example, how do we bring LCA competencies, life cycle analysis competencies, to all or nearly all of our students? You know, how do we train them on these methodologies and how do we make them standard? Um, this is one. Uh, then there are also a lot of uh, soft skills, I think, to develop. And I would say here the first one that is really super critical, I believe, is uh, prospective thinking. I think we are going nowhere on this topic if we don't take people and bring them uh, in 2030 to say, okay, how will your field of activities look like? How will people, you know, work on their needs? You know, how will we transport people? How will we house people? Uh, how will we feed people in Europe, for example, in 2030? And we really need to, to cultivate that type of um, prospective thinking. And so we're trying to do that through various approaches. For example, we developed a course um, where we use fiction, fiction design, as a way to reopen the imaginaries of students and to say, okay, what? Okay, how do, what will the oceans look like in 2030? And then what's the application for several businesses? It's amazing. And I think it's really the type of thing that we need to do. And last, th last thing, I think if we go prospective, mm -hmm. if we go on these needs uh, of basic needs of people, we have a fabulous opportunity to de-silo our disciplines. You know, not do just finance and marketing and uh, information systems, etc. but take, okay, transportation, and then what does it look like according to sustainability trends? And how do we revisit finance, marketing, and other disciplines in that context? So building new skills, reimagining the future. Yeah. Um, Antoine, you're, you're yeah. working with many organizations. So how do you see how they, they, they can improve sustainably and what's, uh, what's some of the suggestions you would have for them? When you look at the skills that are required to drive the transformation, the beauty of it is that we have a pattern. We are 10 years after the digital transformation. I'm a, I'm a kid from the digital transformation. I'm 33, so all of my previous job was helping large company uh, managing that. Uh, collectively, I think we can say that a lot of corporates failed on digital transformation. When you look at the big success, B2C-wise, uh, the, the companies that emerge, uh, look at Airbnb, look at Uber, uh, they are not, they are new players. Uh, if you look at the pattern, if you say, okay, uh, sustainable transformation is exactly the same as digital transformation, probably what we missed was connection between digital and the actual product of the company. Mm -hmm. Exactly what uh, Aurania mentioned. That was siloed. You create a chief digital officer job role, and then you have uh, the CMO that's still doing his job and the head of purchasing still doing the same. And in business school, uh, I was uh, in that kind of school back then, same stuff. You create a, a digital uh, major and that's about it. And then you go back to marketing and it's uh, the same course as before. Uh, so we need to think uh, of this connection at a global level, and we need to go back at the digital transformation and look at what we missed. Mm. That's literally what we need to do. And the, the bad news is that it's going quicker, and to be honest, it's a bit more urgent. Mm. Uh, I mean, the big difference, and I think the only difference between those two big transformations, those big transformation shock for companies, is that this time people care. People care because it's about their children, it's about their health, it's about their parents. So we, the, the right to miss, I would say, is way, way, way uh, less important for companies. If they miss, it's a big trouble. If a company misses its digital transformation, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, so higher stake, quicker, but we've been there. We've tried some stuff. Some succeeded, some did not. Uh, so let's try and learn from, from that previous transformation. So large end-to-end -end massive transformation, involved, but with a good mindset. Tara, is that, does that resonate with your oh, experience and how at JLL? Yeah, absolutely. And I really loved what both of you said because, because that's really the name of the game is when you look at um, how we integrate this, not just in what people's skill sets are, but actually I think it's how people are making decisions. We have to teach people what those decision points are and how to incorporate the sustainability uh, criteria and factors into what they're looking at. Because if we go back to what we said just earlier, which is we have these targets, we don't have the plan. 
if we don't act now, actually the decisions that we're making now is where we're going to be in ten, five to ten years. And I think you know, as, as insurers in real estate, we're on a long-term decision-making plan. So if we don't act right now and if we don't help people make the right decisions now, we're going to be far worse in five to ten years. So I really like the way that you said that, Antoine. And, um, and, and, and this is fundamentally getting people to that, to that level of um, climate fluency is where we need to be. Maybe just bouncing back on that, you need to keep in mind that those are going to be really, really small decisions. When you look mm -hmm. at advertising, for instance, mm -hmm. today, a lot of ads that I look at and I say, Okay, I don't see the point. And then we, you go to social networks and it is greenwashing because he's going with his car to ride his bike, etc. So you're going to need everybody in the company to be uh, carbon fluent or climate fluent mm -hmm. because those are going to be really, really small decisions yeah. with no validation process that are going to have an impact on your company. Uh, and, and that's true in advertising, but it's all of the jobs. It's small purchasing from a company that is not climate resilient or that has a bad carbon footprint. So, if mm -hmm. you, 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 it won't be top down, uh, that, that won't work. You're going to need everybody to understand what's so happening. It has to be a transformation. Mm -hmm. It has to be, a, you, I would say, a situational awareness that everyone mm -hmm. has saying, does it make sense or Absolutely. not? Yeah. But if I may, I agree that it's systemic. I mean, the problem is systemic. So if you don't take it as a systemic problem within the organization, you're sure you're going to be in trouble. It's systemic, but it starts with the top management. And so it's super important also, I think, to really align top management with this responsibility and to make it super clear. Because otherwise, you may also find yourself in a situation where the company is really aware. And you know, uh, by training people inside the company, you are also creating a risk, actually, of uh, over-expectation, good over-expectation, I would say, of employees towards the top management. If the top management is not up to the task, at the right level, then it may create also a problem. So that's something that I think needs to be said. It, it starts with the top. It's systemic, but it starts with the, the, the top management of the company. An additional thing also maybe that I was thinking is in terms of soft skills, one thing we didn't mention is um, that we need also to equip managers more with ethical uh, thinking. Because there are plenty, there are always plenty of contradictions when it comes mm -hmm. to sustainability topics, and there are some structural contradictions that any manager will be confronted to. So you need to give them a bit guiding principle so that they can look at contradiction and say, hey, exactly. that's, that's what really is the right thing to do. Yeah, and, and, and understand the trade offs exactly. because it's actually right this way and right this way, but which exactly. is the righter way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, so actually, we started to talk a little bit about the barriers to change. So one of them is, you know, uh, making sure that leaders are as uh, forward-looking as uh, I would say everybody else. Um, what else, Tyra? What's your in your experience? What are the barriers? Well, I think I think that's a big one. But within that, leaders are forward-looking, but also have to be um, comfortable with some ambiguity. Mm. And comfortable with the fact that we act, we don't have all the answers right now. We're going to have to try and fail on some things, um, and it's okay to admit that we don't have all the answers now, and that we're going to learn about this together. So part of that upskilling is also helping leaders, and in our company, helping our leaders help our clients understand that we're going to come at this together. We don't have all the answers yet, and it's okay to to say that. Um, yeah. So I'd say that's one of the big ones. And not one, yeah. but you, what do you see as some of the major uh, barriers? So I would say skills, skills shortage, yeah. sorry, but that's why I'm in the climate school business. <laughs> uh, so one thing back on the earlier point, there is. That skills was a good thing of advertising, as exactly. you mentioned earlier. Uh, so, so there is a point at board level. Uh, there was a piece in the FT saying that only 7% of the Fortune 500 companies, yeah. board members, have a climate expertise or knowledge. Uh, that's too little, but that's something you can solve. Because guess what, board members, they reunite in a room and that's pretty easy. When I say skills shortage, it's much more about the people we're going to need to hire. Uh, going back to the PwC example, PwC, they announced that they want to hire 100,000 uh, sustainability consultants by 2025. And they are putting on the table something like 12 billion, I think, uh, billion dollars on that. There are not that many sustainability consultants in the world right now. Yeah. That, that's it. And we're talking about... That they were being, they're and, and, being yeah. trained yeah. now, right? They're a, being trained. And ESCP. we're to solve the problem, but maybe... And you certainly have to solve the ESCP is not big enough. You need to, buy, to have new buildings from GLL. We'll partner with uh, no, but there, there with is a, school. There is a point about <laughs> evergreen uh, skills. 
uh, and, and how, do we, how do we train people that are already in a job? Mm -hmm. uh, right now, if you look at training, it's pretty simple. You have three words, one hour, 10 hours, 100 hours. One hour, you learn new stuff, it's cool, you get a carbon literacy, a climate literacy within your job. 10 hour, you learn a new skill. Uh, you're in strategy, you learn a new framework. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, 100 hours, if you do it right, you can learn a new job. Uh, and again, looking at digital uh, transformation, there are some great boot camps format in which in 100 hour, you become uh, a developer or a data scientist. Uh, I think this is the big challenge coming at us. We're gonna need to uh, take people that are in a job and turn them into sustainability experts somehow. The amount of work is amazing. The opportunity as well, because it's also taking people from jobs that maybe are not gonna exist in the future and turn them into that. So, so I would say skill shortage and professional shortage. We're going to face something that is a bit like everybody was fi fighting for data scientists uh, five years ago. It's going to be the same thing. And guess what? Not in five years, tomorrow. Aurelien, do you subscribe to that? Absolutely. I think, actually, I really agree that the, there, there is a need for various formats according to the position of everyone. And that's also why I said we need you know, to have that uh, environmental literacy for all and then have dedicated competencies for mitigation and adaptation that may be more focused and tailored to each one. And I really believe that actually, yes, you need to do that in different ways. And uh, well, maybe 100 hours is very good. I think there is also enormous room for, uh, you know, extended deep dive into the topic. And well, and I think that there are many, many opportunities to partner and we're going to need it because actually the society needs it. So we really need to share knowledge and energy on this topic. Uh, I just would like to jump on, uh, because you were mentioning the barriers. So clearly there, there will be an issue about scaling. <laughs> you know, how, how do we scale? And we are in this difficult um, situation today where we are uh, advocating for the limits to growth somehow. And at the same time, we're experiencing a crisis of growth. <laughs> so we are finding ourselves in this kind of paradoxical situation. Now, I think I agree with Tyra that there is a huge need to transform leadership uh, also in face of this. And I see actually three big issues when it comes to the type of leaders and the risks that we are faced related to, to this transformation. The first is uh, strategic risk. It's like disruption, uh, innovation, um, disruptive innovation. Actually, it's a very classic in strategy that sometimes innovation um, that really goes against the fundamental structure of the company, the fundamental elements of the business model will be ousted. And so maybe the company will disappear because it couldn't innovate because it was too far away from its existing model. And I think that's a very big risk actually when it comes to sustainability because there are structural contradictions. If you're a company that is in a fast consumer goods business where actually the business model is all based on accelerating the selling of goods, there is, I mean, it's absolutely clear that you are faced with a contradiction. Yeah. And so are you ready to shift to a completely different business model? It will be super difficult. And so what you need to do is first, I think, accept that there will be newcomers that will disrupt existing business and for the, in existing companies, I think the good way is also to um, uh, adopt structure where you facilitate internal innovation, where you facilitate mm -hmm. startups inside a large group that will be given autonomy to experiment on radically new approaches to the business. And I think that's a very, very important way to overcome this strategic barrier. So that's the first one. And the two other one, I will be faster. Second, because we discussed it. It's a cognitive barrier. And you mentioned it, like this, uh, it's amazing, this uh, article from the Financial Times where they say 7%, 7%, not 70, 7% <laughs> of the boards are climate, have a good climate literacy. So it m means that there is a cognitive barrier that needs not to be underestimated. So we really, really need to, to bring you know, every employee is to the right level on, the, on this topic. And the last one is the one you mentioned, is about the managerial culture, the leadership approach. It's very tough when you're in a leadership position to recognize a huge problem and say, we're kind of part of it and we have not yet found the solution. 
It's very, very difficult. Mm. And I mean, we can criticize the board for not being well educated, etc. I wouldn't like to be in this position. It's very hard. And we really need to train leaders to tolerate this uncertainty and to be able to make it productive. Mm -hmm. And I think it's absolutely indispensable that on this topic, we collectively recognize the hugeness of the problem and we are putting ourselves collectively in exploring solutions. And that's a very, very radical shift, and I think, in terms of uh, strategic mindset and leadership mindset. So vision, ambition, mm. commitment, you know, it's, it's all about leadership in, in a sense. Mm. Maybe to conclude, let me ask you a, a, a question to each of you. Um, are you pessimist, optimist of the future? Tyra. Oh, I'm absolutely optimistic. I think that's the American in me, um, <laughs> <laughs> the Californian in me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I think um, because with the, there are these barriers, but there's also the levers for change. And one of them is the market. I mean, as, as, as clients are waking up to this, they're actually starting to make decisions that are, that are focused on not just the return on, on the financial aspect, but also on the environment and on the social aspects. And that this is, um, this is absolutely very powerful. And I think that, you know, you've mentioned the younger generation a few times. It's not just them that are that are the idealists the, that that are idealists. We're actually getting to the point where uh, this is percolated into you know the minds of of our senior C-suite. So I am I'm very um, I'm very optimistic, and I think that actually it's the private sector that's often we're, we're seeing moving faster than the public sector. So you know between investors who are making decisions based on. Um, on sustainable on 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 the, the the sustainability of the building and between um, you know in our world occupiers who are saying no I'm not going to move into a new building if it doesn't meet these criteria yeah. we're moving the market um, so I think um, I'm, I'm very optimistic. It's the French in me. I'm a moderately <laughs> optimistic. Um, actually, why do I am moderately optimist? So let's first talk about moderately. Uh, I think if we consider the big stats, we're far from being able to respond at the right level today. I mean, 80% of the energy mix worldwide is still based on fossil fuels. We are heading to uh, more than a three degree warming uh, scenario. I mean, it's just uh, everyone should read uh, the latest IPCC uh, report for decision makers. Huh? It's 40 pages. It's crystal clear. We are confronted with huge risks. And I think part of, we, we need optimism, but we also need realism. And actually, I think that that's a key problem today because I hear a lot of people saying, yeah, we need to be optimistic, otherwise uh, people are not going to act, etc." And that's partly true. But what I see also is this stat, you know, from a, a survey, a recent survey on 12,000 young people between 16 and 25 worldwide and 75 percent of the young people are very anxious about the future you know climate anxiety is widespread and i think they are all the more anxious that they see governing bodies whether political or economic not acting that's generating anxiety and so if we just see political economic leaders saying yeah let's be optimistic it's so cool the risk is that there is going to be a massive split and a big radicalization of the positions between people that are aware that we are not moving in the right direction and others who say, keep cool, it's going to be fine. So moderately optimistic. But <laughs> we have a responsibility to be optimistic and to try to find solutions. My only concern is let's not be naively optimistic. Yeah. We need first to take into account the hugeness of the challenge, the, far that, the fact that we are far off today, mm -hmm. and to realign. And then we can start to discuss optimism. And that's really what we try to do, you know? When you take students, you will first train them on a climate challenge and do a climate fresco with them, etc. And they are like, ah, oh. you know, you are down. You are down because you realize that the problem is actually even bigger than you thought. And you need to have that process, and then to reconstruct. It's super important to reconstruct and bring them somewhere else, not leave them with this anxiety. But it's really also important that everyone 
is aware of the bigness of the hugeness of the issue. Antoine, what's, uh, so yeah, are you reconstructing? So <laughs> I, I, so Optimistically. I, so I'm French as well, so I might say that I'm, I'm with Aurélien on this. So, so uh, my personal story is I, I'm pretty new on sustainability. Uh, before last Christmas, uh, I, I had a vague optimism from like reading newspaper. Uh, and from nine months now, the only thing I'm doing is learning about sustainability. I'm still emotionally optimistic, if you want. I, I don't think humanity is going to disappear. Uh, but the, the scale uh, of what we need to change is massive, M like massive, massive, massive. Uh, so we have uh, reasons to hope. I do think companies are part of the solution, that uh, people are part of the solution, that government are part of the solution. But uh, to people optimistic or pessimistic, the only thing I have to say is read, read, lear learn stuff. Uh, uh, and, and then remain fully optimistic because that's who you are, that's perfect, but do it with fact, do it with number, uh, and, and yeah, uh, do that just do that. Thank you to the three of you for sharing your great insights and your excitement and your uh, move to action. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this session. I took uh, many things from it, many lessons that I will try to apply. Uh, let me share a few of the takeaways I have. Uh, first, I think this is a, is a growing awareness of uh, climate risk in every part of the world. Uh, I think it's not where it should be and particularly with top leadership, but it makes me uh, uh, quite confident we'll address it seriously. Uh, second, uh, even more important, uh, there is a groundswell of uh, volunteers, of people throughout society, throughout organization who want to take action at their level to make a difference. Now, at the same time, we have to recognize the scale of the transformation and how it needs to, ad uh, to address every single um, way that we operate in the planet. So it's difficult. But on the other hand, you know, and uh, uncharacteristically for French, I will be an optimist on this one because with the level of awareness, um, the level of uh, energy around it, and with great insights like our three speakers shared with us, I think we can take actions and make a real difference. If you want to know more about uh, what each of the organization is doing, please do check out the websites of AXA, JLL, and ESCP. I think you will find um, Lots of very concrete uh, examples you can get inspiration from. I also encourage you to check out the AXA Climate School. Uh, you can join and try it. I think this is a great way to upskill, uh, to bring our literacy up, as we talked about earlier. So this concludes this session. And um, I will invite you to join us for the next session in November of the AXA Live Innovation Talks. And thank you very much for being with you with us today. Good.